Joining me now is the United Kingdom former ambassador to the U USA, Lord Kim Darrock. Lord Darrock, thank you very much for joining me. Um, the news Good that day. Alexei Navalny has died will be uh, of grave concern to people around the world. Um, what do you think this says about the state of politics and opposition in Russia? It says it's a dangerous thing to do, Jake. I mean, whether you are a general or an oligarch or a politician, um, if you challenge uh, Putin, if you oppose Putin, there is a pattern here of what happens to you. Now, we don't know yet why Alexander Navalny died. Um, he'd been transferred to a new prison colony north of, north of Moscow, which you can imagine wasn't the healthiest of places. But he was only 47 years old. Um, he looked in good health last time he was allowed to talk to journalists. So it's impossible not to be profoundly suspicious about the nature and the reasons of, for his death. And remember, there are elections coming up uh, in, uh, in Russia this March. And uh, I think whatever else this is, this is also a signal anyone uh, who dares to challenge Putin about the consequences for them uh, of, of running against him. So it's an appalling, it's appalling news. In a way, it's not surprising because of the pattern that I've described, but it shows what is happening, uh, what kind of regime uh, Vladimir Putin is running. And we read today about concerns in NATO uh, about a... Uh, Moscow laying the ground for an invasion of Moldova, something, of course, the Russian government has denied, a similar denial as they issued in relation to Ukraine. Uh, should the people of Moldova and people of the Free West be concerned about these rumours of a potential ground invasion of that country? Yes, they should. Um, you've already mentioned uh, the pattern of denials before the invasion of Ukraine. Now, Moldova is, in a way, an easy and obvious target for Russia. It's not in NATO. And they already, in a sense, have half the country, because there was a breakaway region of Moldova called Transnistria, which leans towards Moscow and which opposes the current government in Moldova. So they've kind of got half of it already. And, uh, you know, you can see that, uh, that, uh, that it would be... You know, extremely vulnerable even to a quite uh, quite small Russian invasion because it's a small, weak and poor country and as I say it's outside NATO. So it's a sort of um, it's a sort of logical thing if you assume as I do that Putin's expansionist ambitions are nothing like satisfied by the 15% of Ukrainian territory that he now holds. And uh, Lord Cameron, the Foreign Secretary of the United Kingdom, has been making references to expansionist philosophies back in the 1930s by Nazi Germany. And he went as far as saying he would lay aside all forms of diplomatic language to start uh, pointing out to the Republican Party and Republican elected representatives that they should be providing more support for Ukraine. Um, has he created a bit of a diplomatic incident here over in the USA? Um, two things to remember here. here. Um, first of all, most Republicans, what you might call mainstream Republicans, support continuing U.S. military aid to, to um, Ukraine. Um, it is the, uh, the hard right of the Republican Party, and of course, their potential nominee for the 2024 election, Donald Trump, who are opposed to it. But part of that is also about denying the Democrats a sort of victory in the House of Representatives by getting this measure through uh, without all the extra issues like action on the border with uh, the southern border that the Republicans want to add to it. Second, I absolutely support what, uh, what David Cameron said and the terms in which he said it, because, Jake, if we were, if we were having spent tens of billions as the West, I mean, much of it from America, but also significant sums from us and from other Europeans, tens of billions supporting Ukraine uh, in its opposition to this, to this invasion by Russia. If we give up now, uh, we will have withdrawn that, and we will have handed Putin a huge success, which will encourage him 
to look elsewhere, whether to Moldova or to the Baltic states or who knows. So uh, this is a really critical time for the West's credibility uh, and for security in Europe, and it deserves really tough language. Lord Danica, I mean, I, I agree with you that David Cameron is right, but I tell you who doesn't agree with them is the uh, Congresswoman from Carolina, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who instructed <laughs> him to kiss my... I'll let you fill in the rest. But we haven't got much time to talk about Marjorie. So uh, one thing that we do... Uh, should be concerned about is Trump's recent comments saying that he wouldn't defend some NATO countries if they hadn't mm. committed 2% of their GDP to defence spending. The safety of NATO hangs by a thread. If you undermine for one second that idea that we will come to each other's defence, surely NATO is at an end. Surely there is no point being a member of NATO if we're not going to defend each other. Do you have concerns about a Trump victory following these extraordinary irresponsible comments that he's made about NATO? Absolutely. By the way, Trump has always been a critic of and a skeptic about NATO. He's always been critical of some European countries' failure to spend their commitment, uh, their political commitment of 2% of GDP on defence. In that, he is right. He has a point. Previous American presidents have made the same point. Trump made it, in particular, a kind of language that was a bit more aggressive than some of his predecessors. They had a point. But, but, whether because of pressure from America, or, I think, more likely, because we now have war in Europe, as the Secretary General of NATO has just said, mm. a lot more countries are spending 2% of GDP on defence, almost 20. I think the figure he quoted was 18 by the end of this year. In particular, Germany, which has always fallen short, is now emerging as the second biggest total defence spender in NATO. So the message has got through, and NATO is mostly doing what it should do. And what Trump said, which is basically a disavowal of Article 5, as you said, the principle of collective defence, is massively dangerous. Yeah. If he meant it, if that became American policy, NATO is less a defensive alliance, more an exercise in empty bluster. It's that serious. Yeah, and I, I say I think it was extraordinary irresponsible. We've had people on from the Republican Party and we put it to them. But why, if Trump is not a supporter of NATO, do you think Putin seems to have come out and backed Biden to be the next president? Honestly, on that, uh, Jake, your guess is as good as mine. But Putin's is the kind of endorsement that no one wants. And there was a history of Trump, as you know, making very favourable remarks about Putin, describing his, him as a genius, saying what a smart leader he is. Um, so it would fit that, that kind of narrative if Putin had said, Trump's my man. Um, and I'm not sure Trump would have actually welcomed that, that uh, endorsement. Uh, and I can promise you, Biden certainly doesn't welcome it. But what kind of game Putin is playing, uh, who knows? But... Anyway, I doubt it's going to change the way many Americans vote. Yeah. Lord Darrett, thank you for joining us. It's fantastic that you say that my guess is as good as yours. I know it's not. That's why we keep having you on the show, because <laughs> you know a lot more about it than I do. But thank you. I'll take that as a compliment. I don't get that many, so thank you very much no for joining us. Thanks. Still with me is Stella and Matthew. Um, interesting comments, I think, particularly around this forthcoming Russian election, Stella, now, we don't know much, many facts about this death, I almost said murder, but this death of the Russian opposition leader. Um, but we live in a very uncertain world and things yeah. like this should, should... People should be... This is really relevant to British politics and the security of our home nation, the United it, Kingdom. It is, and it, 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 it is particularly because we are not in a situation where we can up our defence budget right now. And I agree with some of the comments about other well, countries contributing... Because the money simply isn't there, right? You are, you are talking to the average voter and, of course, they are very concerned about security uh, and about national security and about a demagogue like Putin gaining more power. But you tell them it's between this and between uh, your uh, the, the NHS where you're taking your child when they're sick or between your schools and between your infrastructure, your, the cost of living crisis. What do you think they're going to prefer that the money well, goes towards? I, I, I know, but, you know, you may not have a choice, though. I mean, you that's the, that's the difficult be, yeah. thing, Matthew. Well, I just think... If, you know, if we get a Labour government, 
The big challenge they've got is mm. there may be these things that just come down the line. They may find themselves having to come in and cut public spending to the bone to do things like bolster the defence. Well, actually, budget. talking about NATO, that was the uh, that was the big crisis in the post-war Labour government, of which uh, uh, NATO was one of its uh, uh, hoping to found NATO was one of its great achievements. But it had to decide between free teeth and spectacles uh, mm -hmm. and arming for the Korean War and equipping NATO. So I think you know history repeating itself potentially.